But thank you again for joining us for tonight's event with author Monty Nagler, presented by University of Michigan Press. We'll be watching for audience questions throughout the event. If you're on Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of the screen. If you're watching on Facebook, please let us know your question in a comment. You can turn captions on or off using the live transcript button in Zoom at the bottom right side of the screen. And we'll be recording the event this evening and sharing it on our Facebook page later in the week. Monty Nagler is a photographer, writer, lecturer, and teacher. His photographs have received national and international accolades, including from the State of Michigan's Senate and House of Representatives, which recognize Monty's significant contributions to fine art photography. His work can be found in private collections around the world and has appeared in numerous public art museums, including the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Grand Rapids Art Museum, and the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson. Additionally, his photographs are displayed in hospitals and healthcare facilities across the country, particularly in the Detroit area, as part of Monty's Photos for Healing initiative. Monty has authored six books of photography, including the one we'll be discussing this evening, Monty Nagler's Michigan. Featuring a foreword by former Governor Jennifer Granholm, Monty Nagler's Michigan was published in 2005 and collects 92 stunning black and white photographs of the state's incredible and varied landscapes. Traveling from the Keweenaw Peninsula and the falls and forests to the western UP to urban metro Detroit to the shorelines of Lake Michigan, Monty's photographs portray the rich treasure of all that Michigan has to offer. Monty, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Well, Scott, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks to all the audience who will be listening tonight. Well, before we dive into actually talking about your book, Monty Nagler's Michigan, I hoped you could give us a, a bit of background of your journey as a photographer. How did you get started? Um, when did that happen? Is there a particular subject matter that you're most fond of? Well, it, it is an unusual story. Um, I, I went to University of Michigan. Not, not only that, I grew up in Ann Arbor. Um, but I have a bachelor's degree in engineering and a master's degree in business. And my first job when I graduated college was at Ford Motor Company in what they call the product planning office. We worked on concept cars, future cars. Uh, it was secret. I couldn't talk about, you know, what I was doing. And for a kid right out of college, I mean, this is cool. Very, very exciting. Um, but I never took a photograph other than my kids at their birthday parties. So I was th 30 years old. So I'm kind of a, a late starter. What, I left Ford uh, when I was 30, and at that same year, I built and opened up two Midas muffler shops, okay? And uh, that same year, it was when I almost by accident stumbled on a photography, and I just went, wow, you know, this is fun. It became an avid hobby right from the get-go. I think within 30 days, I had a dark room in the house. I'm already making prints. I mean, this is, this is exciting. So... All through my 30s, I'm really, really getting into photography. Never did like the Midas muffler business. It was too, too exhausting. No pun intended there. Um, in 1979, I was 39 years old. Three major things happened. Big turning point. One, I was approached by the Farmington Community Center about teaching classes. And I thought, well, this would be a lot of fun. So why not give it a go? And I did. I loved it. And I taught for 40 years after that till 2019, including workshops. I taught all over the world. I would take people with me. The second thing, I st started to write a newspaper column, a weekly column for the Observer Eccentric newspapers. That lasted for 26 years. You know, I wrote the weekly column. And the third, and probably the most exciting thing, I applied to Ansel Adams Workshop in Yosemite in 1979 and got accepted. I mean, how cool is this? I'm going out to Yosemite with Ansel Adams. And I met him out there, and he really inspired me. Um, in fact, over my left shoulder, you can see a portrait I took of Ansel, along with a letter that he wrote to me, which is very exciting. Um, so after that year, you know, knowing Ansel, staying in touch, writing articles, teaching classes, I started giving serious thought to, uh, you know, selling the Midas muffler shops, which I did and see if I could turn a hobby into a profession. I was also picking the hardest area of photography to make a living in, f fine art photography. I've never done weddings, I had no interest in it, never had a portrait studio, no commercial. It was a difficult way to go, but that's what I wanted to do. And I just figured if you don't try, you're never gonna know, you know. 
And I always thought too, you know, better to try and fail at something than never even make the try. Okay. And I just sold the muffler shops and the rest is history. You know, I've been well over uh, 40 years I've been doing this. And I feel so blessed all these years to have a career that I just loved doing. You know, very, very fortunate that I had that. Um, and that's about it for the background. Monty, I'm, I'm curious, um, before you actually started getting behind the camera, were you um, a, a fan of photography, though? Or, or did you enjoy art um, no, prior to no, that part of your career? Only up to a point. I always enjoyed looking at photographs. I knew about Ansel Adams, of course. Um, and just making that transition for me was just seemed like a natural thing to do. Very exciting. Monty, do you think that your earlier career working in kind of the uh, design space of the auto industry kind of contributed to you getting interested in photography or influence your uh, photography? Yes, I, I do. Having the, the technical background, having gone to engineering school, I think it helped me to understand the, the, the technicalities of cameras. So forth. It, was a, it was a help to me, yes. And it sounds as though um, you immediately took the deep dive into um, very serious photography um, early on. Um, no baby steps for you. No, it was a deep dive. I think all my life I've liked doing the big steps. You know, it's something I love doing. It's something I wanted to do. And I set my goal to make it happen. Prior to you actually going and studying with Ansel Adams, was there just mostly trial and error, or did you kind of um, try and take any classes before that? No, I, mostly trial and error, Vic. The only class I ever took was with Ansel, so I'm pretty much self-taught. You know, of course, I made a lot of mistakes, but then I, I learned from them. So, you no, know, pretty much all self-taught. And Monty has kind of... Um, your kind of main focus of, of landscape photography changed at all over the course of your career, or has that always been, you know, the main interest? Well, it's been one of my interests, landscape photography, but I, I like so many different subjects. Uh, if I go to a foreign country, especially in Asia, I find their faces very exotic. Yeah, I really enjoy taking them. Um, horses have always been a passion of mine. And I have a whole series of horse pictures I took. I really enjoyed that. But I think one of them is going to be shown later today. And cowboys. I always had an interest in cowboys. So I have a whole series of cowboy pictures. So I was really interested in a lot of different subjects. Landscape being the, the main focus. And Monty, after having that opportunity to take photographs all around the world of, of all types of different subjects, um, do you find that Michigan still has a, a special place in your heart when it comes to photography? It, it, it sure does. In fact, over the, all these years, the main question I get asked is, what's your favorite place to photograph? And I've been to so many you know, exciting places, but Michigan is right up there at the top of the list. I, I love Michigan. There's so much photo opportunity in Michigan. Um, it's, it's just right up there. I love it. You know, hence the, the Michigan book, you know, but I have a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, photography from Michigan. It's the, it's, it's the best. Monty, I think another um, interesting part of your journey as a photographer is how much technology has changed over the course of it. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that, how um, your, the, the, the technology has really influenced what you're able to do yeah. behind a camera. Yeah, it's changed a lot and it's continually changing. Um, when I started out, I was shooting just a smaller format, black and white film cameras. Um, in 1979, when I finished studying with Ansel, he recommended that I go to what's called a four by five camera or large format camera. And if some of the folks don't quite know what that is, it's the kind, it's a big, heavy cameras, always on a tripod. You get under the black cloth, you know, and you pull the slides in and out. And it was Ansel that suggested I do that. And as soon as I came back, I, I did just that. That changed my whole vision. 
shooting large format and photography to me became even more exciting um, than what it had been. Um, I was a dedicated film guy for a, a long time. Uh, digital at that point just it didn't interest me, although digital was fairly new at that time. Um, I love working in the dark room. Yeah, I did all my own printing, even for exhibits. I did my own matting and framing. I, I did it all. In 2007, I went to digital. I was shooting a little bit of film and digital. And once I started digital, I went, this is neat. I can do so much more. You know, even though I was pretty savvy in the dark room, you know, produce a lot of great prints. But with digital, you can do so much more. And I looked at the computer screen as a dark room on my computer. Okay. Instead of the wet dark room, it's, uh, it's on my screen. And I, I love doing digital, always have. And you can actually, you know, create uh, a lot more with digital than I could before. I look at it, my photography is like an artist, a painter. It starts with a blank canvas, and they can add, you know, what, what he or she feels they want in the picture. I look at my photography, it's almost like a blank canvas. And I could take a picture of, say, this barn and then I can get the trees over the barn and if I don't have the trees there I can create them from another image I have so I'm able to combine lots of different images in one and that was always very exciting to me to be able to, to do that and I just got more and more into digital um, I just I, I loved it I, I wonder also Monty did um has when you made that move to digital, did it allow you to um, take more photographs and be just more, um, I, I don't know what, what the right term would be, but um, just taking more shots than you might have if you were it, working in film? Yes, it did. When I shot the four by five camera, and I would say take a, tree, a trip overseas, um, you have to be very selective when you shoot that kind of camera. Um, if I came back from a, like a two week trip in Europe and I had 10 or 12 good shots, I figured that was a great trip. Okay. But now once I started doing digital, um, I can just take so much more, but I'm still very selective. You know, I just have a little more to choose from. I, I don't believe that like a lot of people shooting digital do, they'll go out and take a, a hundred pictures of a subject and then they'll go through and select the ones that they really like. I, I did not do that. I just put, put the ones that I really enjoy doing and just kind of whittle that down uh, to the ones that I really enjoyed. Did you continue working um, with film after you sort of made the shift to digital though? Was that still part of your, um, your approach? Uh, for, for a short time I did. And eventually I stopped the film. The cameras I were using were, were so heavy and when I would travel, so much equipment I would have to take, and then uh, my sore back wasn't getting any better. <laughs> so, and then I went exclusively all, all digital. Monty, something else I, I wanted to talk with you about um, was your experience kind of taking that dive into making something you were very passionate about your livelihood. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there who um, are, are really passionate about something, whether it be photography or some other art form, um, but don't really know how to take that step. Um, what was that like for you? Yeah, it, it is gutsy to take a step like that. But again, as I said, if you don't try, you're, you're never going to know. But what I would advice I would give to um, photographers, even artists uh, coming up, is photograph the things that really interest you, that hold your interest, hold your passion. Okay. You've got to do that. Um, share your art with as many people as you can. You know, get it out there and share it. Um, and one of the most important things of all, you've all heard of the starving artist syndrome, <laughs> which is alive and well, whether you're a photographer, painter, writer, or whatever. You have to learn marketing skills, be able to market yourself. You have to even take some cl classes in marketing okay? because if you can't market yourself, no matter how good you are as a photographer, it's going to be hard to make a living doing it. Marketing is just key uh, to everything. Our whole economy is based on marketing. So that's one of the main things is learn marketing. You know, get some books on marketing, take a class in marketing. And when you do that, 
you know, you can fine tune your skills with marketing, you know, and you got, you know, great imagery to begin with, then you're going to make it. Take the chance to, okay, and, you know, and just doing what you love doing as a profession, you know, and it's so exciting to go through life with a job that you really, really like, you know, in fact, they the old saying, he or she who loves what they do uh, for a living, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's good. Never, never works a day in their life. Monty, in those kind of early days of um, you getting into photography, did you really go out of your way to seek out constructive criticism from people to kind of try and hone your craft even further? Oh, I always welcomed it. I always welcome criticism because you take in the right way, you're going to learn from it. You know, and when somebody, you know, critiques my photography, they're doing it with my interest at heart. They were trying to help me out by doing that. And I, I welcome that, you know. And over the years, yeah, a lot of criticism, but I, I really welcomed it, you know. And I would help out other photographers by criticizing their work, trying to help them, you know, you know, to to uh, to you know enhance their skills. On that topic, um, from your time working with Ansel Adams, do you recall any particular lessons besides the change in equipment um, that you really took to heart that you think um, kind of shaped the direction you headed? Yeah. Well, I mean, just being with him in Yosemite, I mean, th that's a high, <laughs> you know, just being out with him. But yeah, I learned what's called the zone system from Ansel. In fact, he developed it uh, back in the early 40s. The zone system is a way of seeing the world uh, of color, but you're pre-visualizing it in black and white. And then knowing what to do in the exposure, the negative, the developing, and the printing to achieve j just that. And that's what really the zone system is all about. So I use the zone system a lot, you know, you know, through, through my photography. Monty, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, training with Ansel Adams and kind of working on your craft for so many years helped you um, become the photographer that you are. Um, but did you come into the field, you think, with some some sort of eye, some particular um, skill that helped you get where you are? Was there something innate um, that helped you become a great photographer? Uh, I, I do. And one of the most important things, too, is what I call vision, to be able to see things in the vision. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of amateur photographers, they buy all this expensive equipment, thinking that the expensive equipment it's going to help them make good photographs. Then they wonder why their photographs aren't strong because they lack vision. The vision is so important, you know. And without the vision, you just you're not going to produce great imagery. I think some people, it's it's an innate thing. They just have the vision uh, up to a point. I think it can be learned, um, but it's one of the the key elements. Monty, I, I hope we could spend a little bit of time talking about um, your Photos for Healing project. I know that was a, a big part of your business. Um, could you, you tell us the story behind that? Yeah, it became um, the big part of the business, and it started in the year 2000. So we've been doing it for, and retired two years ago, for tw 20 years. Um, my wife in 2000 quit her job in the computer industry to come work with me. She's a guru of marketing. And, you know, she took the ball from there and she was so able to market this stuff. Um, and what it is, I'm selling imagery to healthcare facilities, hospitals all over the country, especially in the Detroit area. Um, I think there's not a hospital here in Detroit that doesn't have pictures of mine in it. That University of Michigan Hospital, I've got a number of them up there. The whole intent is to help patients, you know, get, get through procedure, to relax them. OK, I mean, just imagine you're a patient and you're going to go have an MRI and you get really you're nervous about it. If you look up at the ceiling at an imagery and a lot of mine are up in ceilings, put it on acrylic and backlit. It helps you to relax. It has been proven by what they call press Ganey reports that art, you know, photography, art, music in healthcare really helps patients. And one of the biggest satisfactions I got through all my career is knowing that my photography can help patients in healthcare get get through a procedure that 
might not be too easy for them. We, over the last 20 years, we got so much feedback from hospital staff, uh, patients themselves would write or email, just saying how the pictures really help them. And that gives me you know, a wonderful feeling. And, you know, I, I wish um, we'll, we'll share some links of, of some of these images after um, the event this evening, um, but we're, we're not necessarily talking about um, just photos and frames like are behind you. Th these are really integrated into sort of the, the architecture and design of some of these facilities. Isn't that right? Yes, we work with the designers, with the marketing people at health, hospitals. We work and work, even work with some of the CEOs of hospitals. And it goes beyond just a matted and framed image. Um, there, as I say, there are acrylic up on the ceiling, the wall murals uh, all over. But the, the largest picture I ever sold is at Henry Ford Main Campus on Grand Boulevard. It's 89 feet long. That's the size of the picture. You know, it takes up an entire wall. And boy, do we get feedback about that picture. And a lot of them are just big murals like that, you know, which to me is exciting, you know, producing a big mural and going into a hospital. You know. it, it must have been a, a extremely fun, sort of almost working in that different medium, um, still a photograph, but in this completely different format than, than you'd work. It's different, yeah. Well, I would take pa panorama pictures too. So a lot of the murals began as a panorama picture. In some case, cases, we'd have to clone them together, you know, to create more to mirror the image in order to get the length that the hospital wanted. So we were, you know, easily able to do that, you know, with my, my technical assistant and then working with great processing labs too. That, that must have been a whole bunch of fun um, and not, you must have gotten an opportunity to work with um, architects and designers, as you said, who brought their own kind of eye to yeah. um, kind of using your photographs in interesting yeah. ways. Yeah, we did. We worked with architects, as you say, designers, marketing people, you know, and then hospital staff. In some cases, we would present options to even the hospital staff, like the, the nursing staff, and ask them to pick out what, what they felt they, they would enjoy, what would help the patients out. So I, I really like getting a lot of other people involved in the decision too. Well, for something sort of completely different than your work with hospitals, um, as we mentioned, this book, uh, Monty Nagler's Michigan, came out in 2005. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the story of how this came together? Yeah. You know, um, as I said earlier, I, I love photographing Michigan. I was approached uh, by U of M Press back then about being interested in doing a book of mine on Michigan. And I said, absolutely, you know, what, what an exciting project. And once, you know, I got the go ahead, I did a series of uh, what I call wandering trips around Michigan. I would take, you know, like a week or so, just go up the East Coast, photographing whatever moved me. You know, nothing in particular I'm looking for. I just, what excites me and moves me. I did a trip up the West Coast, did a trip up to the UP, you know, gathering images. Now, I had a good body of Michigan work prior to that because I love Michigan, had a lot of, you know, travels in Michigan. And then, you know, we, I talked to my wife and I, once we got to go ahead and I think somebody you have impressed, his name was Kevin, said, who could we get to write the forward? And then the most natural person to write a forward on Michigan is the governor. So we approached Governor Granholm, set up a meeting with her. She was very receptive to us, receptive to the idea, and she agreed to do the forward for me, which was, you know, very exciting. She was terrific to work with, by the way. So, you know, she did the forward. In fact, um, when she was governor, she used my book as a, um, the, like the state gift. When people would visit her in Lansing, they'd get a copy of my book, which again is re really terrific for me to do that. So, and that's, that's where it all came to be. And it was just pretty, it was great working with the staff at U of M Press. Uh, it, it was just, it was a, just a wonderful experience. Monty, I know the book contains photographs um, taken kind of throughout the year. There are some winter shots, some spring, some summer shots, some fall shots. Yes. What is the sort of overall time frame you think um, that the book captures? When was the earliest shot? When was the last shot? Um, 
Well, it's a, a great period of time. I mean, re, those you know, wandering trips were more current imagery at the time, but I had a lot of body work prior to that. And I felt, too, you can reproduce in black and white the four seasons, you know, even though there's color. I mean, you know, taking a fall picture, you know, in black and white, you can tell that it's a fall picture. Winter, obviously, you know, you can tell it's winter. And I love doing winter shots, too. Winter shots in black and white it really works often better than in color. So, yeah, I tried to capture, you know, all the seasons and it seemed to work out great. When you um, took those trips up the, the West Coast and into the UP, did you know that you were going to be um, taking black and white photographs or was that still um, kind of up in the air a little bit? No, I think right from the get-go, um, black and white is what UVM Press wanted. It was, it was going to be black and white. And uh, now I took some color film with me because, you know, you can't go on these great trips and not shoot some color. But for the book, the all, all black and white, which I think is different, too. I think, um, you know, uh, the reason I like black and white, too, although I love color, is that black and white is more e emotional, touches the emotions more than uh, color does. Um, it's it's creative, what you can do in the dark room. Um, an analogy I've, I've used over the years when people ask me, you know, color versus black and white is, is this. Color photographs are like going to see a movie. Black and white is like reading the book. See, it stimulates your imagination, the emotions. It, I think it draws you into the picture, you know, the, the tonalities and so forth that often color doesn't have. Now, I love color. I've you know, always shot a lot of it, but there's something about black and white that's special. When you were um, taking those trips and you sort of knew that your medium was going to be black and white, um, were you looking at shots and thinking this is going to make a very good black and white shot um, or just that this is a good shot, period? No, it was both. First of all, it's got to be a good shot or I wouldn't you know, make the image. But I mean, all, all my career, when I looked at you know, thinking black and white, it has to work in black and white. And sometimes they just won't if it's a color shot. It's got to be able to work in black and white or I wouldn't take it. So I think the imagery in the book were ones that, you know, I considered work in black and white. So. Monty, do you have a sense of um, how many photographs you kind of started out with that then you kind of winnowed down to the 92 that were in the final book? Uh, for the book, um, I, again, I was always pretty selective. But if I found, you know, a particular um, scene I really liked, I, I think one of the pictures you might be showing is Bond Falls up in the Western UP. I, I love Bond Falls. It's my favorite waterfall of any all over the world, seriously. And I've taken waterfall pictures all over the world, but Bond Falls is just extra special. So there, I, I took a number of pictures of Bond Falls. In fact, I think the Michigan book has about eight of them in, in the book. One of them you might be showing is that panorama one, you know. Um, this is, so. Yeah, maybe I can just put that on screen now, Monty, and, and you can kind of talk us through um, that image a little bit. Okay. Um, did you want to pull it up or just want me to? Wait a minute. Should be coming up now. Can you see it? That's it. In fact, it's one of my favorite photographs. Um, yeah, that is Bond Falls shot with a panorama camera. Uh, back in those days, I had an actual camera that shot panorama film, and this is one of them. Um, got a lot of mileage off this picture. The I would also shoot color of the same thing. The color version of this picture has been in a lot of, lot of hospitals over the country. It just works well in color. It's one that soothes and relaxes patients. And uh, it works good in color and black and white. But this picture I've always just kind of had a passion for. It. There's one hanging in my house of this one. So, yeah. Monty, have you um, gone back to photograph Bond Falls multiple times or was this kind of your one style? No, many, many times. I rarely go to the UP without stopping at Bond Falls. A lot of the workshops I taught where I took students with me, 
a lot of them incorporated the Upper Peninsula. I would always uh, take the students to Bond Falls. And if they were there for the first time, I could just see their jaws drop when they see it. This picture you're looking at here is where it kind of meanders, kind of, you know, along. Bond Falls has two large 60-foot drop-offs, you know, where the water is just cascading. You know, it's, it's, it's very exciting. Even the sound of it is exciting. So, um, yeah, and people, they just love Bond Falls. Do you try and shoot it from kind of similar angles and vantage points, or are you trying to find new things at Bond Falls to capture? Yeah. Bond Falls, because I love it so much, I've taken from, you know, numerous angles over the years. And every time I go up there, I see new images of Bond Falls that I could do that maybe I hadn't seen before, but it's just, it's just so, so many opportunities at Bond Falls will not go up to the UP without stopping there. I'm also curious um, about your time at Bond Falls with students and, and whether they have captured any shots that uh, of the falls that kind of really caught your eye, um, that kind of you got to see the falls in a different way. Yes. I'll, often after these trips, we'll have a gathering when everybody's home and, you know, process some of their pictures. We'll get together and review the pictures. And I've seen numerous strong pictures of Bond Falls uh, that my students have taken. And I know that a lot of them have told me they've gone up afterward on a, a subsequent trip. They've gone back to Bond Falls, you know, because they, they love it so much. Well, I'm going to move on to a different shot, Monty. Um, you had mentioned um, your interest in cowboys. And speaking of the power of black and white uh, photographs, I think that this one um, really speaks to me uh, of what the emotion that black and white can capture. It, it does, yeah. Because it's, you know, late afternoon, it's silhouetted. You get an emotion with silhouetted pictures that often you don't get. Um, my whole cowboy series were taken at the Double J Ranch, which is in Rothbury, Michigan, in, in the Muskegon area. I've been up there many, many times. Um, in fact, this when I took this picture, Popular Photography Magazine uh, made me one of their mentors on their mentor series. And at one point they asked me, they wanted me to teach a workshop in Michigan, any place I wanted to go. And I selected bon, um, Bruce Crossing or the Cowboy Series. And so this was obtained on that trip. Um, so it's just, yeah, I, I just, uh, there's something about the Cowboys too. I get to know some of them. There's a wholesomeness and honesty with Cowboys, you know, and uh, it was just a, a great experience being up there with these guys. I'm also curious, Monty, um, I, I'm sure photographing animals presents all sorts of different challenges that um, a, a more standard landscape does not. Um, and, you know, I, oftentimes they probably don't do what you'd like them to do or, or pose in what you were hoping for. Um, is, that, is that correct? Yeah, and it's a different challenge. I mean, just like the cowboys are a different challenge. Um, the animals are a different challenge too, but I, I enjoyed photographing animals, whether it's out in the wild or even at the zoo. Um, so I always liked it. It is a different kind of challenge, um, but I, I enjoyed that challenge and I feel I produced some you know, pretty good animal pictures too. Yeah, and, and here is another one that um, just strikes me as, uh, let's see here here we go That's um, a, yeah you had um, to be in the exact right place to capture this um and, and you probably didn't have many opportunities to get just this no, perfect shot no. that's also at the double j ranch and before i did the workshop up there uh i went up there and sat down with the wranglers uh to set up photo ops you know for my students and this was one of the photo ops i told them that i've always wanted to take a picture with horses just charging right at me, you know. And, and they said, we can do it, and this is it. And you can see the ringers are hurting them right at me. Now, you might think, was I safe? <laughs> Back here, there was a fence right in front of me, probably about three feet high. I had students lined up either side of me, and they ran them right at us. I mean, it was perfectly safe, because they, as soon as they got to the fence, they took a 90-degree turn and just went off. Um, I wanted this picture so bad for myself, I would have stood out there to get it. And the wranglers told me it would have been okay because the horses would, would just go around me. 
but it's always been a favorite picture of mine too. But probably my favorite horse picture I've done. Was there a particular technique you used um, so that you did not get any of that fence in the shot though? Um, well, I shot over the, over the fence. Okay. Okay. And because this was film, okay, and they're coming at me really fast. So you have to be, you know, very careful. So I, you know, I preset the exposure and shutter speed. Okay. And I focused on just a little rock right out in front of me, you know, be about 50, 60 feet. And I kept my eye on that rock, you know, and also my eye on the horses coming towards it. And as soon as they hit that, and I had pre-focused too, as soon as they hit that rock, that's when I took the picture because I knew it would be in focus. So I planned that one out in advance. Okay. Did they um, circle back at all? So you you were able to take multiple shots or was this sort no, of a, it was just a one time one, thing? One time, either, either get it or you lost it. But I tell you, they all got good shots. And I told them ahead of time, you know, how, how to do it, you know, just to pre-focus on, an, you know, on something and just snap the camera when they get there. Why don't we move on to another photograph from the book? Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of great winter shots in here. And maybe you could talk a little bit about this one. Yeah. Uh, that's up in the Upper Peninsula. And again, with the panorama camera. Here, the black and white, I mean, it really works on winter scenes. And it had just snowed. The, the, the branches were covered with a dusting of snow, which is, is just beautiful. And uh, again, I composed it very carefully. I want to get the, the two larger trees kind of off center and, and made the image. And again, um, and it came out great. I've often sold this picture as a what's called a triptych. A triptych is a piece of art split into three pieces. So I can, if you can imagine looking at this picture, you know, split into three with a space in between. It has a lot of impact that way too. So I've done this picture as other panoramas as, as a triptych. Monty, what I, I really love about this image is, um, you know, sometimes you'll see uh, illustrations that are so lifelike that they appear to be photographs. And this is almost like the reverse. It's it's a photograph that the lighting is such that it, it almost looks like yeah. a, a drawing in some ways to me. Yeah. It, it looks like an etching to me. In fact, the name of, that I've given this picture is snow etching. The, the trees are edged with snow, you know. I tell you, winter scenes, you know, you can get some awesome photographs in winter scenes. It's cold, you gotta bundle up. <laughs> I think it was almost zero degrees when I took this, but you know it's it's worth being cold to get a picture like this. Let's go to another photograph. Um, so we've seen that and seen that, and then we move into more of the kind of summer and uh, and That's, and spring that, scenes. Um, that is Crooked Lake up near Petoskey, and again here I just the the idea of the the, the lone bench out there at the end of the dock. And it's kind of off center, you know, and use, I use the dock as a lead in line, you know, to lead into the subject, um, make sure to incorporate some of the, you know, the lily pads in the picture and um, had a great cloud day that day. I've always been a cloud person too. I always look for good clouds. In fact, I have a full folder on a computer of cloud pictures. So once I went digital, you know, if I wanted to add clouds to a particular image, I go right to the cloud file and pick out one that I think, you know, works with that image. So. This one has that sort of uh, amazing contrast between the very straight lines of the, the man-made structures and then sort of the, the natural spaces um, mm -hmm. clashing with it in some ways. You're, you're, you're exactly right, Scott, yes. Do you um, find yourself drawn to that kind of intersection of the natural world and kind of more human structures? Yeah, um, I do. And I try to incorporate the two and make them work together in, in, in an image. So, yeah, I, I do that, too. Um, you know, if I take a picture of a, of a barn, I mean, everybody likes photographing barns. There, I'll try to incorporate the barn, the fence, the background, which would be trees, you know, a, a great sky, you know, 
uh, maybe uh, have, have a horse in the picture as reference. Yeah, I do like to combine the two, especially on trips to overseas, um, you know, to combine like in China, like a, a pagoda with a, you know, with a natural landscape, how it fits in with the landscape and so forth. To make kind of a statement with my photographs, that's what we really wanted to do. Monty, is is architecture sort of a passion of yours as well? It um, is. I like I like doing that too. Um, I thought we had a uh, an image of a barn in here. Uh, I'm afraid not. But um, yeah, please go on. Okay. Well, this picture also. Now this is at the Double J Ranch again, up in Rothbury, uh, with a panorama camera. And you know, when I walked and saw this scene, to have those six boats just lined up perfectly. You know, it, it's natural for a panorama picture. And so here it's you know, panorama. I'm combining the the background of the trees, the reflection. You know, it all seems to work well together with this one. I'm afraid we don't have any of the images um, that you took from downtown Detroit, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Um, your time in the city taking photographs. Yeah, you know, I, I have a lot, of, a lot of pictures from Detroit, and when when we would sell pictures to you know, buildings downtown Detroit who want to you know, show the images of Detroit in their building. I have a whole file of Detroit images. My my favorite, and it's not here, I took a picture of the Detroit skyline from Canada, okay, with panorama, okay. Now, this was digital, so it took, I think, six images to create the panorama of Detroit. Then I went back it was like five weeks later to the one night of the year where the Detroit buildings are requested to leave their lights on at night. It's kind of a kickoff to the holiday season. I shot the same picture, you know, at nighttime. And then with, you know, a computer, join the daytime to the nighttime. So the nighttime becomes the reflection of the daytime. To go one step further, I took a panorama of the, of the Diego Rivera mural at the DIA which I think is probably the greatest work of art that the city of Detroit has. So I took that, I converted that to black and white and replaced the clouds in the sky with the Diego Rivera mural, okay? And also put it in the water as a reflection. So you see the mural in the, up above and down below, okay? I don't think, it, I've never seen a shot of Detroit like that before. And I've got a lot of mileage off that one. It's so unique and different, you know? And I just talked to somebody today. He says, I want to get a copy of that Detroit mural with the Diego Rivera in it. It is so cool. You know, so that's probably my favorite from Detroit. I sold a lot of those. I think Henry Ford Hospital has a maybe a 14-foot one of that you know, somewhere in the hospital. Well, and that's just uh, a great example of where digital has really allowed you to kind of dream something and then make it reality, right? Exactly. Do you feel that uh, when you were working exclusively in film, you kind of were more limited in certain, you know, in those ways? Um, yeah, I was a little limited in the creativity, you know. I mean, that would be an impossible shot to get in film, you know, take you're trapping it in. I mean, you know, I mean, darkroom work it was fun and, and it's a challenge too. You know, I enjoyed it, but you can only do so much in darkroom. So a shot like that last one I just des described uh, would not be possible. I think we have one more shot um, here. Where was this taken, Monty? That's, that's a Taquamanon Falls. That's the pathway uh, to get to the Upper Falls at, at Taquamanon. And again, I think it's just, it's just, it just calls for itself to be shot in black and white. And I like that little mist in the center there, which has to get a little misty, really adds to the picture. I use the fence on the right as a lead-in line, you know, to draw attention into the picture. And that also has been a favorite winter shot of mine. Ati, when you were um, gathering these images for the book, um, and, you know, I, I know you went into this with kind of certain spe specifications that you talked about with University of Michigan Press about probably how many photographs would be included, that sort of thing. Were there any that kind of got left on the cutting room floor that you, you really loved and, and wish had been able to be included? Um, they got left out of the book. Yeah, I, th I think there were a couple. 
I mean, you know, they were limited as to how many pictures could be incorporated in the book. And, you know, they, they were selective and they asked my input on selection too, which I, you know, gladly gave. But yeah, there were some other ones that, uh, that could, could have been, a, I, I, there was one of U of M Stadium I did that I really liked, but it, it didn't make the cut for the book. But it's still, you know, pretty good shot. I got in when there was nobody in the stadium, just completely empty. And it's just looking down, you can see the entire stadium from above. And I shot it with a, you know, wide angle lens. And, um, and I always liked that one. Got some mileage out of that too, but I wish it would have made the cut, but it, it didn't, which is okay. Monty, when you were working on um, putting the book together, um, were you trying to do, with when you were deciding on the arrangement of the images, were you trying to make some sort of statement with that or, or just what felt right? Yeah, no, I was trying to make a statement. I think some pictures on opposing pages can work well with one another with maybe another picture wouldn't work quite as well. So yeah, there was some thought into the the layout and the arrangements of the pictures too. And I remember sitting down with some of the U of M press people and we kind of did, did this together too. Monty, I, I think that you mentioned um, you've also published another book or, or several at this point of photography. Could you talk a little yeah. bit about those? Yeah, the, um, this, this was my third book, was the Michigan book. Um, the first book was called, it was instructional. Uh, you know, I wrote for the Observer Eccentric newspapers for all those years. They published my first two books. The first one was a collection of my newspaper columns with photographs. The second book they did was called Statements of Light which is a black and white pictorial book from all over the world. The third was the Michigan book. There was one uh, on Vietnam and Cambodia I did. Uh, there was one I worked with Lauren Esselman, who's a mystery writer, okay? Lauren and I did a book together. Fake Wayne University Press uh, did that one. Um, talking about his, his fic fictional character, Amos Walker, okay? Uh, the book after that, was called Quartets. I published that one, where it's a it's uh, each page has a quartet of photographs that all relate to each other. Um, a little hard to describe, but you have to see it. And that book did really well. And then um, the book I just did, because it's difficult to photograph anymore, and my memory for all my photography works pretty well. <clears throat> my wife may not agree that my memory works pretty good. So what I did, it's called. Um, um, just I took 67 photographs from around the world over a 47 year period, ones that had in interesting stories. So the book is called, you know, the story behind the picture. So and it, it's actually sold out. So on one page is the picture, the other is the story that describes the picture or the back with it, what happens when I took it, the story behind it, a lot of interesting stories, you know, you know, going to these places, people I've met, experiences along the way so that's my latest but well, we do have uh, a couple questions that i wanted to turn to um, one is more of comment just love monty's work um was one comment we got um and another was uh, how, how do you decide what images to shoot um and you, you've touched on this you know throughout the evening but um could you talk a little bit more about that how do you decide what what are the images you want to photograph again it's ones that 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 hit, hit me in the gut you know they visually have impact that i'm moved by them i'm excited by looking at the imagery i want to look at it i want to you know take a photograph of this and you know reproduce it and then share that with other people you know i want to get people to appreciate you know the world a little bit more and I've always felt that through my photography, I was able to, to do just that. I, I set out to make a difference in people's lives, you know, all these years. And I feel confident uh, that, that I have done just that. <clears throat> Auntie, do you have any advice for um, folks who are very passionate about photography and want to kind of take it the next step, um, improve their skills, um, improve their eye? Yeah, as I said, yeah, improve your eye, 
uh, keep up, you know, technically with what's going on. Only photograph subjects that motivate you, you know, it, it move you and excite you. And then, as I said earlier, to take it to hopefully make it as a living marketing skills, to develop the marketing skills is so important, you know. Marketing skills are equally as important as your, your photography skills if you want to do it for a living. So. Well, we only have a, uh, a few minutes left. Um, we've been sort of wrapping up our events by asking all of our guest authors uh, what they've been reading lately, whether they have any recommendations of books that people might want to check out. Well, yeah, I'm an avid reader. But I have quite a library in my house, probably a you know, thousand books or so. Um, I like reading lots of different things. Often I will have two or three books going at the same time. And it's like one of them I'm reading is called The, the Abyss by Max Hastings. It just came out and it's, uh, it talks about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay. Now I was 23 years old when that happened. And I remember being scared during that, you know. Everybody was. I mean, they were on the brink of a nuclear war. And I mean, thank goodness for John Kennedy. But I remember that one. It's interesting reading about it. Another one is called Prisoners of the Castle by Ben McIntyre. Uh, during the Second World War near Berlin, there was a castle called Kolditz, Kolditz Castle, which was built about 1,200 years ago. Hitler took that over and made it a prison. Okay. And more escape attempts were made out of Coldhead's Castle uh, than any other any other place during the Second World War. So I find it very interesting reading about that. Also, um, chain of, uh, they get a, a diversion, Chain of Command by Tom Clancy. It's just kind of a good kind of an escape novel too, and those are fun. But I'm always having a book or two going. Have you had a, a chance to photograph castles? Um, I'm oh, sure that must be incredible. Yes, L lots of them. A anytime I go to Europe, you know, I you know, love photographing castles. You know, there's a, ro a romanticism about them and it you know, makes you wonder about the history. In fact, in the, the new book, Story Behind the Picture, I've got some castle pictures in there. Then I'll go into not just my experiences photographing it, I'll go into the history of the castle, when it was built, okay, what battles were fought there. And, and so forth. So yeah, I've always love photographing castles. Well, Monty, thank you so much for being with us. Um, do you have any kind of final thoughts you'd like to share? No, nope, just um, for those that love photography, keep on doing it. You keep you know honing your skills. Um, and the main main thing is just have a lot of fun doing it and share your work with other people too. Monty, um, would the best place for um, people to learn more about your photography be your website? Um, they can't, yeah, yeah. Even though you know we uh, closed the business down a couple of years ago, my website is still up and working, and they can see a lot of imagery there, so forth. And it's just um, www.montynagler.com. Great, and we will share that both in the chat and on Facebook so folks can check it out. Um, as a reminder, Monty's book, Monty Nagler's Michigan is on sale um, and we will be posting the special discount code that can be used on the University of Michigan Press website. I think that is still going to be live um, for a few more days, so check it out. Um, it's a, at a great price with free shipping um, and we'll include that on both, there it is, in chat and on Facebook. Um, thank you so much again, Monty, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and have a great rest of your evening. I appreciate those. I appreciate you having me on the program. Thank you.